I want you to understand that we have one of the preeminent Bible scholars of our day in our midst. And so, I just want to, I want you to give him the warmest welcome you can possibly give as he comes to share the Word of God. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. I love you. Thank you. I love you. Good evening. Good to see you all here. Amen. We'll turn to somebody and say, tonight, we're going to get something brand new from the Word of God. Amen. Turn to somebody else and say, tonight, we're going to get something brand new from the Word of God. Amen. I want to pull this back just a... Can some, Joel, can you come... I want to pull this back just a little bit more, if I may, Pastor Mac. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want my wife, Denise, to stand up. Denise, we're glad that you're here today. And this young man that just helped me is Joel Renner. This is our youngest son. And Joel really runs our whole ministry. And we're so glad that he's traveling with me and Denise this month. And Pastor Mac, I want to say especially thank you to you and to Len, because in the past three years, I've canceled my meeting in your church either two or three times. And the reason I canceled our services here is because we were living in very troubled times in our part of the world due to COVID and due to po some political issues, which I'm going to be discussing in tomorrow's services. I'm going to preach something tonight, something different tomorrow morning, something different in the second service tomorrow. But an event took place in my life that prohibited me from crossing, crossing the Russian border for a long time. It was completely beyond my control. And I want to thank you for being gracious and for forgiving us and for having us in your church. And we think that Mac and Lynn are amazing. They are amazing. I said to Pastor Mac as we came in here today, I said, you're ageless. You never change. <laughs> and really, he and Lynn are some of the greatest examples to us. And I want to thank you for who you are. And you did not need me to be here today because you do a masterful job. And thank you that you would allow me to speak in the pulpit of your church. I really mean that, Pastor. But hey, do you have your Bibles? Let me see your Bibles. Hold your Bible up in the air. You always bring your Bible when you come to church. And I want you to open your Bible tonight to Matthew chapter 24. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you about end time realities. And I'm going to give you a good reason for why you need to show up for the prayer meeting tomorrow at 3 o'clock. And Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for this time in the Word of God. And Holy Spirit, we look to you as the great master teacher. You are the one who wrote this book. You're really the only one that has the authority to teach it. And so tonight we defer to you. And we ask you, Spirit of God, to take us into the scriptures until we feel them, we live them, and we're changed by them. Open our hearts. Open our minds that each of us, including me, might be taught by the Word of God tonight. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from the King James Version. And tonight we're going to begin in verse 3. And verse 3 says, As he, that is Jesus, set up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? If you have an ink pen or a pencil, circle the word when. Tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Either underline or circle the word what. Then if you would, either underline or circle the word sign. And then also underline or circle the word end and the word world. So when you come to verse 3, you find these key words, the word when, the word what, the word sign, the word end, and the word world. And when you really unpack this verse, you understand exactly what the disciples were privately asking Jesus. And first they said, tell us when. In Greek, the word when is the Greek word pote. It's very specific. It was the equivalent of saying, Lord, we don't want a general answer from you. We want to know specifically exactly when these things will come to pass and what the word what in Greek is the little word T. If you're taking a note, it's spelled T-I. 
It describes the most minute, minuscule details so the disciples were saying, Lord, we want you to really zero in. First of all, we want to know precisely, precisely when these things will be, exactly what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. The word sign is the Greek word suntileus. And actually, this word describes the sign that you would see as you're traveling along the road. It is the very same word we would use today to describe a road sign. For example, Denise and I live outside the city of Moscow. Isn't that amazing? And every day as we journey into the city of Moscow, we pass signs along the way. And the signs tell us where we are in the journey. The signs tell us how much further we have to go before we reach our destination. And if there were no signs, we would not know where we were in our journey. But the signs identify where we are, and the signs identify how much further we have to go. And the disciples here were literally saying, Lord, what will be the prophetic signs we'll see on the prophetic road to the end of the world? The word end here does not describe the end of the world as if the world is going to end, because the world will never be end. The world is going to be changed. The word really is What will be the sign of thy coming and of the end or the conclusion of the world? The word world is the Greek word ionos, which describes an age. So they were literally saying, Lord, please, while no one else is here, it's just us and you, and no one else is listening, we want to ask you some questions that we can't ask you in front of others. First, when exactly will these things be? And Lord, please tell us exactly when and what precisely what will be the sign that we will see on the prophetic road to the end of the age to let us know where we are and how much time is left for the journey. And then Jesus begins to answer them. But what is interesting is they asked singular for one sign, but Jesus gave them many signs. And beginning in verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. But most people skip over verse 4 and verse 5 and just skip right to verse 6, where Jesus said, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And it's interesting that if you go to Luke chapter 21, verse 11, Jesus adds two more things. Jesus said there will be fearful sights and great signs from the heavens. And these are two particular phrases which have really puzzled translators for years because the phrase fearful sights is the old Greek word for monsters. And that is a literal translation. At the end of the age, there will be monsters. In fact, you cannot translate that word any other way. However, today, that word makes sense to us because we are living in a world of monsters today. People that are transforming their bodies to be what their bodies are not supposed to be. And Jesus literally prophesied that we'd see monstrous things happening with people at the end of the age. And then he said, great signs from the heavens... The word fum is the Greek word apo. It describes something descending right out of the heavens, implying that there will be some kind of heavenly activity in the skies when we come to the end of the age and that there will be an increase of that activity. Jesus didn't tell tell us what it was, but it shouldn't surprise us if we're beginning to see things in the heavens above. But while most people jump right to verse 6, And talk about wars and rumors of wars. And then verse 7, nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom and famine and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Most people skip the first sign which Jesus gave, which he also listed as the most predominant sign that we have come to the end of the age. And that first sign is in verse 4. And in verse 4, Jesus says, take heed that no man deceive you. The words take heed in Greek is the word blepete. It's a direct form of the word blepo, which means listen, listen to me. It's almost like he's reaching out to grab hold of their jackets and shake them up. He's really trying to get their attention. If you want to know what is the predominant sign, Jesus said, this is it. Take heed that no man 
deceive you. And Jesus listed worldwide deception as the primary sign that we have sailed into the last days, into the end of the age. And the word deception that was used in verse 4 is a very specific Greek word which the Holy Spirit uses repeatedly in the New Testament, the Greek word planeo. And what is very interesting about this word is this was a word which was popularized by writers between the intertestamental period, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some people say that God didn't say anything in those years, but my friends, God has always been speaking for anybody who has an ear to hear. And in those intertestamental years, there was a fascination with the end of the age, and the writers and the rabbis of that period, which radically affected the thinking of the New Testament and even the thinking of Jesus, prophesied that at the end of the age, spirits of delusion would be released into society. And that leads us to this word planeo. This word planeo, which here is translated as the word deception, means to lead someone off track, but not just that. It means to lead someone morally off track. And particularly, this word planeo describes a person who has walked upon a well-worn path year after year after year after year, but now for some reason he has decided to err or to divert from that path, and now he is walking treacherously along the edge of a very dangerous path. He has erred from what is sound and what is safe to a route that is morally dangerous. And in fact, this word planeo was the very word used by farmers to describe an animal that had gotten so lost it could not find its way back home. And now Jesus employs the use of this word deception, the Greek word planeo, to say at the end of the age, society as a whole will begin to divert from the moral path it always considered to be correct and will begin to walk on the edge of a very treacherous moral path that is filled with all kinds of danger, And in fact, it will appear the society as a whole has gotten so far off track that you will wonder if it will ever be able to find its way back home. And what is very interesting is this word planeo is used in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, where it is translated as the word delusion. We could call these delusionary times. And my friend, If there was anything to describe the day that we're living in today, we are living in delusionary times. When people believe what is contrary to science, people no longer believe what they have been taught, but they have opted to divert from a well-worn path to embrace something which to us seems simply silly. But Jesus prophesied this would occur at the very, very closing of the age And what's really interesting in the New Testament is every time that you read about the coming of the Lord, it always has a parallel text with deception, which finds these two things are going to run side by side. There's going to be deception right at the end before the coming of the Lord. Now, I want you to turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, begins to also describe what's going to happen in society at the very end of the age. And when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, the King James Version says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. The word know is the Greek word ginosko. A better translation would be you emphatically must know this. You must understand this. And again, it is like the Holy Spirit is speaking so strongly. He's reaching out to grab hold of us. He says emphatically, categorically, you must know this. That, the word that in Greek is the word hoti. It's pointing to something very, very specific. It is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit saying, now I'm going to tell you explicitly exactly what you need to know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Well, some people say, how do we know we're really living in the last days? People have been saying for 2,000 years that we're living in the last days. Well, anyone who says we've been living in the last days for 2,000 years is 
theologically correct because the last day started on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out and Peter prophesied and quoted Joel chapter 2 and said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And the church age is also called the last days. But when you come to this verse, The Holy Spirit is not just speaking generally of that 2,000 years of church history, but he's pointing to the very, very, very end of the age. We know that because of the word last that is used here, which is the Greek word eschatos. It is where we get the term for eschatology, which is the study of the very last things. But this word last, the Greek word eschatos, was used very specifically to describe the very, very, very end of of a thing. For example, you could use this word last, the Greek word eschatos, only to describe the last day of the week. Only the last day. You could use the word eschatos to describe the last week of a month, but only the last week. Or you could use the word eschatos to describe the last month of the year, but only the last month of the year. It points to the ultimate end of a thing. And in fact, This word was used to describe the ultimate ends of the earth, and the word last, the Greek word eschatos, was used navigationally to describe a ship that had sailed to the final port, and once they had reached this port, there was no more time left for the journey. That's the word that is used here. So now we understand that in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, the verse could already be translated like this. This know emphatically, categorically, that when time has sailed to the last port and no more time remains for the journey, you will know it because perilous times shall come. What does the word perilous mean? The word perilous is the Greek word kalopos. If you're taking notes, you spell C-H-A-L-E-P-O-S. That word kalipos is only used two times in the New Testament. It's used here, and it's also used in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. And in both places, it describes something that is so dangerous, we would say it's filled with high risk. If you get near to it, it is likely that you will be hurt. Therefore, you need to protect yourself because you're sailing into territory that is extremely perilous or dangerous. And I want you to hold your finger here and turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 28 to see the only other place where this word perilous is used in the New Testament. And this will help you understand what are perilous times. And when you come to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible tells us Jesus crossed over the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs And if you're reading the King James Version, the next two words say, exceeding fierce. Everybody say, exceeding fierce. That's this word, kalipos. And as it is used here, it describes these men as being so perilous, so treacherous, that they posed a risk to anyone who was trying to pass through that region. And that is why the verse goes on to say, so that no man might pass by that way. Well, if you've been to Israel, you know that there was an ancient road, a highway that went all the way around the Sea of Galilee. And on the east side of the Sea of Galilee was the country of the Gezerines or Gadarenes, where these two demon-possessed men were. And there was a road that went from the north of the sea to the south of the sea. You could take it all the way to the city of Jerusalem. And if you were on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, that is the road that you would take. And now we find from Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, these men posed such a risk to those who were traveling on that road that people traveling on that road would stop. It was like they hit an impasse because when they reached this particular point, it was like peril came charging out of the tombs. This was a menace to the people in that region. And therefore, these men represented an impasse and people did not know how to get around them. Now keep that in your mind. And go back over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. This know also. Again, the Greek word genoskete, emphatically, categorically, you must know this, specifically that. When time has sailed to its last port and no time remains for the journey, you will know it because perilous times that feel like an impasse 
shall come. Shall come in Greek is even important. The Greek word in is to me. The word in means to be in. The word is to me means to stand. When you compound the two words together, it describes a person or a group of people who are standing in the midst of something that surrounds them on every side. It doesn't matter where they look. They feel like they are surrounded by it. They see it here. They see it here in is to me. They're standing in the middle of something that is dangerous. It is treacherous and it is perilous, filled with peril. And they feel they've hit an impasse because it feels so inescapable. They're standing in the midst of nonsense and deception. And now when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, the Holy Spirit says, when you've sailed to the last port, you'll know it because you will feel morally you have had an impasse in society. And everywhere you look, you will see nonsense all around you. And again, Jesus called this the age of delusion, the age of delusion. Now turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And when we come to Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, the Apostle Paul writes about what man will be like at the end of the age. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The word hold in verse 18 is very important because it is the Greek word cat echo. The word cat echo really means to suppress. It's not that they don't know the truth. They know the truth. They don't like the truth. And therefore they say, put a lid on that, cap that, suppress that, kill that story, bury that. It is the efforts of ungodly men to suppress the truth. And then it says in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Then verse 21, because that... And in Greek, again, it has the word hote. Because of this, specifically this, when they knew God, the word knew is the Greek word ginosko, which here describes a general knowledge of God. It's not describing a society that was all born again, but rather here it describes a society which has a fear of God. They have a knowledge of God. They have a respect of God. And Paul says there was a time when they generally knew God. They feared God. They respected God. And they glorified him not as God. Glorified not is the Greek word which means to stop glorifying God, almost as though it is no longer popular to worship God and acknowledge God as we once did. And therefore, we're going to reverse this. We're not going to acknowledge. We're not going to glorify him as God any longer. And then it says, neither were thankful. And by the way, neither were thankful in Greek The opposite of it describes a people who feel they are entitled. And when you are not thankful, you just feel you're entitled to everything. This is the age of entitlement. And the verse says, and became vain, the Greek word metaios, which means utterly wasted in their imaginations. The word imaginations, the Greek word logismos, which is where we get logical thinking. They became wasted in their logic and their foolish heart was darkened. The word heart, the Greek word cardia, it's where you get the word for cardiac, it's the word for the physical heart. So you have to think about what the physical heart does. The physical heart pumps blood. It pumps and pumps and pumps and pumps and it pumps blood until every part of our body is affected by the pumping of the human heart. But now the Holy Spirit says at the end of the age, whereas the human heart pumps blood, The heart of society will be darkened. And just like the heart pumps blood, the heart of society without God will begin pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping darkness until darkness will begin to pervade society. And then when you come to verse 22, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The word professing means alleging alleging themselves to be wise, the word wise here, the Greek word sophos, alleging themselves to be progressive thinkers, alleging themselves to be the 
uppercut of society, the leaders of a new society. This is what they allege about themselves. But remember, these that are alleging that have ceased to glorify God. They have now moved into the age of entitlement. Their heart is pumping darkness. And all the while, they are professing themselves to be the new progressive thinkers of a new age. But Paul says, when in fact they became fools, and the word fools in Greek is the word moreno, and you can guess, it's where we get the word morons. And a literal translation is professing themselves to be progressive thinkers. In fact, in God's view, they became morons. That is a literal translation of that verse. Verse 23 tells us how moronic they became and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God unto an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Well, at first, when you look at verse 23, it almost sounds like a lesson in zoology. What in the world is this verse about? Change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. What you have in verse 23 is a history of idolatry in reverse. This is one of the most brilliant verses in the entire New Testament that Paul, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, could summarize in one verse the history of idolatry. And if you study the history of idolatry, it began with creeping things. Everybody say creeping things. Man in the earliest ages worshipped bugs and snakes and creeping things. Then as time began to go by, man's mind began to ascend. And he no longer wanted to worship creeping things, so he began to worship four-footed beasts, cows, cats, all kinds of four-footed beasts. By the time that you get to the period of the Roman Empire, now man's mind has ascended again. They're no longer worshiping creeping things or four-footed beasts, but now they're worshiping the birds that fly. And that is why the eagle was the insignia of the Roman Empire. Their minds were ascending. They were thinking higher and higher and higher. And now in this verse, Paul literally says today... And at the end of the age, people will worship man. But before that, they worshiped birds. Before that, they worshiped four-footed beasts. Before that, it was creeping things. But at the end of the age, when man is full of himself, man will no longer worship these other things, but he'll focus on himself and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man. Man will become the center of his own worship. And then in verse 24, Paul adds, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Often people read verse 24 and they say, Well, the problem is God. God just gave up on them. But in fact, that is not what the Greek says. The Greek says, Wherefore God also released them. It is the equivalent of saying, if you no longer want me and you want something else, I will not hold you back. God released them to themselves. God released them to uncleanness. The word uncleanness used here always carries the connotation of sexual uncleanness. Through the lusts of their own hearts, and notice this amazing statement, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And now we find from verse 24, at the very, very end of the age, we'll, always, we'll also know we've come to the end because we will be living in the age when people dishonor their bodies. They do things to their bodies that are dishonoring. But there's something else. This word dishonor also means to displace, to put bodies in configurations that are not natural. To put bodies where bodies do not belong. Then he says in verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Or man now is going to try to become his own creator. And when you become the center of your universe and believe that you are God, then you will believe you have the right to do what you want to do, to create what you want to create with no restraints. Verse 26, 
For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, also having to do with sexual connotation. And again, when it says God gave them up, a better translation would be God released them. He released them unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. The recompense of their error is described in the following verse. The following verse says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. This is not a generation that does not know about God. This is a generation who once generally feared God, but chose they would no longer glorify God and neither express thanksgiving to him that focus only on themselves and make themselves their own creators and put God away. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a what? Reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Reprobate mind is the recompense of their error which was meet. The word reprobate, what does it mean? Well, when I was a boy, we called everybody we didn't like a reprobate. But we really didn't know what the word reprobate meant. The word reprobate, the Greek word adikimos, the word dikimos, describes something that is marvelously made, it is fit, it is excellent in every way. But if you put an A on the front of it, that thing which was marvelously made has now become so modified that now it is a flawed mind. It's no longer a mind that functions as God created it to function, but now because of the process of mental modification, false images, false truth, false teaching, pounding the mind, and lamb-blasting the mind again and again and again and again. That mind which once thought so brilliantly and was made so miraculously becomes ill-affected because of what it is seen and what it is continually hearing. And here we have a description of what is happening in our world today primarily through the media, and through social media. As from every angle, the world is trying to lamb blast the minds of our young people to change the way that they are thinking. And we know from science today that the mind has a kind of plasticity. You can actually affect the way that the mind thinks and the way that the mind believes. You can change it. You can alter it. And if you lamb blast it enough, you can flaw the mind, and the mind will begin to believe what is wrong is right, and what is right is wrong, which is exactly what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. He said, a day would come when men would call darkness light and light darkness. We're talking about the age of reprobate when the mind has been so modified that it no longer believes what it once believed. And what is really scary is that it's very possible for a Christian to become reprobate in certain areas of his or her life. If he hangs with the wrong crowd, listens to the wrong information, and allows his mind to be affected, though the Spirit of God lives inside him, he can modify his way of thinking that he no longer believes what he once believed, but now he's going with the crowd. He's embracing a more inclusive, woke kind of thinking. Mental modification. That's what the word reprobate really means. And when the mind has become reprobate, we find the fruit of it beginning in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignant whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, and listen to this, who knowing the judgment of God. This is not an ignorant people. This is a people who once knew the truth, but now planel, they have veered from the path they once walked upon to try something new. They have wandered off track. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure 
in them that do them. Now I want you to go in your Bible to 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to begin in verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 where the Holy Spirit again is speaking about the end of the age and pointing 2,000 years into the future, the Apostle Paul writes, now the Spirit speaks expressly. The word expressly in Greek is the word retus. It describes something that is emphatic, something that is categorical or unmistakable. The Spirit speaks emphatically, categorically, unmistakably. In other words, He's trying to make sure we really understand this is going to happen. And these scriptures were not given to scare us. They were given to prepare us. If we understand what is coming, then we can insulate our family and rescue the perishing and care for the dying that are all around us. The Holy Spirit is preparing us. Now, the Spirit speaks emphatically, categorically, unmistakably in the latter times. Here, the word latter, the Greek word husteros, describes the very, very end of a thing when not much is left over. Some, thank God, it says some, not all, but some shall do what? Depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But notice it says some shall what? Depart. It does not say some shall abandon. It says some shall depart. There's a difference between abandoning and departing. To abandon the faith is outright rejection, but to depart from the faith is very different because here we find the Greek word ephistomy, the word apo, which carries the idea of space, and the word stami, which means to stand. A better translation would be in the end of the age, some will begin to put distance between themselves and what they once believed. They'll begin to put distance between themselves and the faith, and the faith here is with a definite article, which means this is not faith for miracles or faith for finances, but this is the faith, the clear, sound teaching of Scripture, calling it into question as though it is no longer popular the way that it once was. And little by little, very slowly, methodically, the Holy Spirit in this verse describes a very slow departure, people who begin to distance themselves from what they once believed, maybe viewing it as something that's old or something that is archaic, something that doesn't fit into the presence. And why are they doing it? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And guess what? The word seducing, again, is that word planeo, the same word which Jesus used in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, which means these will be spirits of seduction, particularly that cause people to morally err from what they once believed was right and was wrong. And notice it also says, doctrines of devils. The word doctrines is the Greek word didaskali. It's a compound of the word didasko, which means I teach. And the word kalos, which describes something really excellent. You put the two words together, we would describe this really well-packaged information. And here we find at the end of the age, the age which we're living in now, the devil's no longer going to come with a pitchfork in his hand and horns on his head, but he's going to come with well-packaged, convincing information, PR, bombarding the minds of society, bombarding the minds of children. This is why it is so dangerous today to send our young people to the university because in the university, they can lose their faith. They're being bombarded from their teachers. They're being bombarded by the courts, bombarded by entertainment. The devil trying to mentally modify an entire generation. And notice it says doctrines of demons, the Greek word daimonion. And in the first century, when Paul used that word demons, the Greek word daimonion, they believed that this daimonion spirit's were the primary cause for delusion and lunacy and madness. Which means when these spirits have been released and people begin to follow them, it produces thinking that is off base. Delusionary thoughts, lunacy, error-filled confusion, because they have been seduced 
by these spirits with well-packaged information. Now go back over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want us to look at verse 1 again. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This know also, emphatically, categorically, know this, that in the last days, when time has sailed to the last port and no more time remains for the journey, periods of higher risk will come. You will feel you are surrounded on every side. And then as you continue in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he begins to describe in great detail all the characteristics of society at the very end of the age. Then when you come to verse 14, Paul says to Timothy, and he says to us, and here is God's instruction to us if we're living in the end of the age. But continue thou. Everybody say continue. Continue. Continue in the things thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So now when you come to verse 15, we Paul see that Paul is telling us regardless of the world does around us, we are to continue in the scriptures. And then in verse 16, he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But notice at the first of verse 16, he says all Scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. Inspiration of God in Greek is the word theopneustos, and this is really important. It's one of those words that's difficult to translate because there's so much in it. Theo is the word God. The word penustos, the second part of the word, has three meanings. First of all, the word penustos is from the word penu, and it describes a fragrance like a perfume. A fragrance like a perfume. Secondly, that word penustos from the word penu was the very word which was used to describe music. Music. When a flautist would put the flute to his lips and he would begin to breathe into the flute, it would begin to produce what was called pnu, such wonderful, beautiful music. And this word penustos, which here is trans from the Greek word pnu, was also used to describe creative power. For example, you see it used like that in Genesis chapter 1, where it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep, and the Holy Spirit released his creative power. That's the same word, the word penustos, from the word penu. And now Paul gives us this amazing revelation that the Scripture is so filled with the power and the presence of God that when you embrace the Scripture, when you take it into your life, it doesn't matter what kind of stink you have going on in your life. The Scripture will bring a new fragrance into your life. It will bring a new aroma into your home. Well, considering that society at the end of the age is going to be filled with a lot of stink, we need heavenly fragrance coming into our life. And number two, if you feel the music in your house is sad and things are dark, open the Word of God, dive into the Word of God, because the Word of God will bring a new sound into your life. It will bring new music into your house. And if things are really messed up and seem they are irretrievable, remember that the Spirit of God brings power in the Word, and the power of God in the Word of God has the power to recreate, create, set everything back in order. Well, this is good news. Especially if you consider we're living at the end of the age when people are going to be so affected. But we have something that has within it creative power. Creative power. The sound of heaven is in this book. The fragrance, the aroma of heaven is in this book. And the tragedy is believers have one in their bathroom, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the car, but they never open it. And in the book that they rarely open are all the answers that they need. In fact, there are so many answers in the Word of God that he goes on to say it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. Everybody say correction. The word correction 
is a particular word which describes a person that has been knocked flat in life. Do any of you know anybody that's been knocked flat? Maybe knocked flat in their job, knocked flat in their relationships, knocked flat in their morals. But this particular word, correction, means to take a person that's been knocked flat and to pick them up and put them back on their feet again. Which means the Word of God has the ability to take that person that's been knocked down, pick them up, put them back on their feet again so they can function once again. And for instruction in righteousness, verse 17, that the man of God, in Greek it says, tis, anyone belonging to God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto all good works. What does that mean, perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto all good works? It's a very unique word which is only used to describe one thing, so it only has one possible meaning. This was the word you used to describe a boat that was completely outfitted. There were two types of boats. There was the simple boat, which had no oars, it had no sail, it had no equipment, and because it didn't have any special equipment, it could go out a little ways, but it couldn't go very far. It certainly couldn't make it through rough weather. It would rarely make it to the other side. But you could take the identical same boat and thoroughly furnish it. You could give it an oar. You could give it an anchor. You could give it a sail. You could give it all kinds of equipment. And suddenly, that boat, which became so simple, is now so thoroughly furnished, it can make it through the roughest of waves. It can make it through the worst of weather. And it can sail all the way to the other side. Now, think how brilliant this is. Think how brilliant this is. The Bible is so amazing. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says this, know also, when you have sailed to the last port and no time remains for the journey. Then when you come to verse 17, he tells us it's okay because if the word of God is working in your life, you'll have everything you need to sail through any weather. It will give you the anchor you need, the oars you need, the sail, everything you need to make it through the worst of times, the stormiest of weather, and you'll make it all the way to the other side. And that is why it is so important that you attend a church like this one. Say amen. amen. Where the word of God is proclaimed week after week after week after week. Friends, when Pastor Max stands in this pulpit and speaks, it's just like a good dose of health and common sense just pours out of him. I love to listen to Pastor Mac. The Word of God, which can equip you thoroughly, furnish you. Now, I don't think anybody in this room would question the age that we're living in or would question that we're living in delusionary times. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus enumerated a whole list of things we would see at the end of the age, but he listed this as number one. He said, when you see this, when you see deception working in society and people believing things that are contrary to science and are simply wrong, when men are calling darkness light and light darkness, you'll know you've come to the very end. But now we know from 2 Timothy chapter 3 that for us there is an answer. You do not have to fall victim with the rest of the world. We are to continue. Everybody say continue. 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 Oh, that word continue is so powerful. I could teach a whole hour on it. I will not. It's the Greek word meno. The word meno means to abide, to continue. It also means to maintain the ground you've already gained, to not surrender your ground for any purpose. I wrote a book several years ago called How to Keep Your Head on the Straight in a World Gone Crazy. That's the world that we're living in. 
But just because the rest of the world has lost their mind does not mean we have to lose ours. And in fact, today, if you'll just stick with the Bible and continue, you'll already be leagues ahead of the rest of the gang because you'll have common sense that will guide you. And when you're guided by the Word of God, it makes you smart. It makes you smart. You're able to discern what is right and what is wrong because the Word of God is working on the inside of you. And your children need this as well. And I want to say one more thing about children. And then I'll give this to Pastor Mac. A great concern today, I'm sure, by most pastors is the tendency of parents to cave for their children. They raise their children in church. They raise their children, teach them what to believe. And then, unfortunately, they see their children beginning to reject what they have been taught. It's exactly what First. Peter chapter 4, verse 1 says, it's not an abandoning of the faith. They just begin to distance themselves. They have new friends. They want to be more inclusive. They want to be more open-minded, more woke in the way that they think. And parents tragically often say, if we don't bend and go with them, we're going to lose them. And rather than continue in what they believe, parents have bailed on their faith to accommodate their children. And here is the real tragedy. When those children really get in trouble and need help, they will not have their parents to come back to because their parents bailed. The most loving thing you can do is to abide by what you know to be true and not to bend, not to break. Amen. Amen. I want you to put your hand on your heart. I want to pray for you, my friends. This is why you need to all turn out for prayer tomorrow afternoon. We need to believe for God to move in this nation. God wants to pour out his spirit. People need a move of God in this generation. And Father, we thank you that the word of God is so abundantly clear. Lord, you did not give your word to scare us. But you did give your word to prepare us. And you love us so much that you have clearly communicated what those who live in the end of the age are going to see and experience. Help us to pay attention. Help us to pay heed to your word. And Father, help us to be a tower of strength to our children and to those who are around us who need us. They need us. And we pray, Father, for a move of the Holy Spirit in this precious nation. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Move by your spirit across the United States. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Amen. Amen. Pastor Mac? Y'all stand up, please. Thank you, Rick. Well, let him really know how much you appreciated that tonight. Amen. I mean, the, um, the revelation is there. We just need to open our hearts to it and, and let it sink in. Amen.